Hi again, this is uh, Dr. Villar, and on this uh, second presentation, we're going to look at some studies that address uh, whether uh, chronic nitrate exposure in ruminants uh, create any health problems. And this is uh, one of those areas uh, where there is a lot of uh, disagreement uh, in the literature. You may find that uh, sublethal levels of nitrate uh, cause a lot of, a lot of uh, adverse health effects, uh, like uh, poor body growth, or lower milk production or vitamin A deficiency and so on. Uh, but most of those uh, claims uh, uh, come from uh, field observations and, and truly there isn't uh, many uh, well-controlled research trials uh, that verify most of those claims. Uh, if we look at some of the experimental studies, uh, we have to include these ones uh, by Dr. Davidson and his colleagues. Uh, as you can see, they were published in the Journal of Dairy Science in the 60s and they really push the animals to their uh, limit of tolerance uh, to high levels of nitrates. Uh, and it's uh, truly uh, amazing how these uh, animals develop mechanisms to adapt or somehow compensate for a deficiency of uh, oxygen in their blood. As you can see, uh, the objectives of the studies were to see if, if there are any effects on fertility, pregnancy, growth, uh, lactation, and they also determined uh, what, what are the mechanisms of adaptation to continued high exposure to nitrates. So they took uh, 20 heifers uh, of about uh, 16 months of age, uh, and they divided them into groups uh, depending on their uh, physiological stage uh, before they had been bred, uh, 40 days into pregnancy, and 150 days into pregnancy. Uh, these animals uh, were fed a good quality alfalfa grass hay, uh, with uh, two kilograms of a concentrate uh, divided in two equal daily feedings and, based, and a fixed amount of uh, nitrate was added uh, to the hay uh, basically to simulate a natural exposure uh, to a forage with a high nitrate, nitrate uh, content. Uh, now if we look at uh, the results on this uh, other uh, slide, on this uh, graph we see that uh, the methemoglobin response uh, on blood samples taken four hours uh, after feeding, uh, which was the point of the day they considered the animal would have uh, had the maximum or peak levels of uh, methemoglobin. Uh, and as you can see, the data shows that uh, levels of between 40 and 70 percent took place uh, daily for months in each of the three groups of animals. They do mention a huge uh, vari variability uh, between animals. And they explain that uh, such a variation, depending on the quantity and the speed of uh, feed uh, consumption uh, every time they were uh, feeding. Uh, they reported that uh, two animals out of the 20 uh, that were receiving the highest uh, levels uh, died after uh, 8 and uh, 10 months. And they do mention that uh, both of these animals uh, were found dead in the morning without really any previous uh, signs of illness. Uh, if we look at this other table, uh, they show that uh, some of the adaptation mechanisms that I uh, mentioned uh, earlier, uh, the heifers uh, responded to nitrate uh, by increasing the number of uh, red blood cells, uh, hemoglobin concentration, and uh, pack cell volume. The, uh, the plasma volume was the same, so basically these uh, increases uh, were not caused by dehydration, but uh, we could call that a genuine uh, erythropoietic uh, response and basically the main trigger mechanism or a stimulus for an uh, erythropoietic response uh, is uh, chronic hypoxia. So really in this case uh, the heifers are basically producing uh, more red cells uh, so that uh, blood can carry uh, enough oxygen in spite of the high levels of uh, menhemoglobin. Uh, so really in conclusion uh, that uh, menhemoglobin is uh, being produced daily uh, for months. That's uh, based on a single sampling at four hours uh, post-ingestion and this is accompanied by uh, compensation mechanisms uh, to increase uh, ox for oxygen uh, transport. Now if we look at uh, the results on uh, reproductive uh, performance at uh, various uh, stages of uh, reproduction, the only thing that uh, truly stands out are uh, three abortions uh, and even though they did not uh, know the exact levels of uh, methemoglobin in those uh, dams uh, when the fetal death uh, took place, they had uh, measured those levels weeks before, and they were uh, consistently high on, on those uh, dams. 
And as I mentioned earlier, uh, two other uh, heifers uh, died uh, months after starting on the nitrate exposure. Uh, there were also uh, heifers uh, that uh, collapsed at some point during the study uh, due to high uh, levels of uh, menhemoglobin. Uh, but they mentioned that uh, those, some of those animals, in spite of uh, collapsing, ended up uh, delivering uh, normal calves. With uh, regards uh, to the length of the estrus cycle, uh, there, is, there was really no effect uh, by nitrate. And uh, with uh, regards to a uh, uh, number of uh, conceptions, they couldn't really uh, confirm uh, whether there was any impact. This was uh, inconclusive because they had some problems uh, inseminating uh, some of the animals, uh, and they uh, actually didn't use uh, enough animals to really uh, compare between groups. So that was kind of inconclusive. For the other uh, potential uh, impacts uh, of uh, nitrate, there was uh, no effect on uh, birth weights. The growth rates and the performance of uh, those uh, calves uh, were normal. Uh, the average uh, milk production uh, was normal. Even though the milk uh, was uh, being secreted with uh, 15 per parts per million of nitrate, which still is uh, within uh, acceptable li limits uh, for human consumption, uh, if, uh, if these levels are uh, set at uh, 45 uh, parts per million. It's not shown in this table, but uh, when they look at the levels of vitamin A in the liver and plasma, they were also within the normal range uh, for cattle. So the hypothesis that uh, nitrate uh, may uh, uh, create uh, vitamin A deficiency was uh, disproved, at least on this uh, one study. Now, if we look at the conclusions uh, from these studies, we find that heifers uh, will adapt to levels of nitrate that are uh, potentially lethal uh, of about uh, 440 milligrams uh, per, per kilogram, uh, which could be uh, an, the amount ingested in a hay that uh, contains 2% uh, of dry matter uh, nitrate, or even more, uh, 660 milligrams per kilogram, uh, that could be a hay with up to uh, 3% of its uh, dry matter of uh, nitrate. At first, uh, there was a lot of uh, feed refusal, and this uh, effect was uh, transient. The animals uh, could definitely detect that there was something uh, wrong in that hay, and they, they were kind of reluctant to eat it at first, but eventually they didn't really, inha didn't really have a choice, so they ended up uh, uh, eating that hay. There were uh, no effects on milk yield, or uh, and composition, uh, no effect of uh, uh, on uh, the time of uh, gestation and delivery, uh, no effect on neonatal weights and growth, and basically the levels of vitamin A in the animals uh, were uh, normal, as I said before. What remains unresolved from this study is whether there may be any effects on uh, conception rates uh, with the highest exposure of uh, 3%. There was no effects definitely at 2%. And also, if uh, there is uh, no uh, hemoglobin formation on the dam, uh, an abortion uh, cannot be uh, attributed to nitrates. And I should probably add that uh, it's likely that the amounts of uh, hemoglobin that you need to see on the dam would probably have to come close uh, uh, to levels that would be uh, nearly uh, fatal for that dam if we want to induce an abortion. Just as there is so much uh, uh, controversy on the effects of uh, chronic exposure to nitrates, there is probably even more on what constitutes an acceptable intake or a toxic dose. And in this respect, there are some excellent experiments like the ones uh, published on this uh, Dutch uh, journal in the late 70s. And they did a pretty good job uh, looking at the changes that take place in the rumen. As you can see on this, uh, on this slide, uh, the objectives of uh, this study were to evaluate the effects of uh, nitrate on menhemoglobin formation uh, after uh, continued exposure, speed of intake, uh, type of diet, and the dose of uh, ingested. And I'm not going to explain how they carried out these uh, experiments uh, to save time. So I'm just uh, going, to, going to jump uh, straight away on the results. When they uh, plotted the highest uh, values of uh, nitrate, nitrite, uh, not nitrate, nitrite, in the rumen fluid, and those of uh, methemoglobin in blood, uh, there seems to be a pretty good uh, direct uh, correlation between uh, both uh, variables. 
and this is important because uh, whether the animal whether the animal is going to reach a lethal level of uh, menhemoglobin uh, is definitely going to depend on attaining uh, levels of uh, nitrate in the rumen high enough in probably a very short time enough to be absorbed uh, before they can be further uh, detoxified in the rumen and in order uh, to reach these uh, high concentrations in a short time uh, the rate at which uh, nitrate in the roughage uh, becomes available uh, in the rumen is also uh, quite important. Uh, if we look at this uh, other graph, the percent of uh, nitrate that diffuses quickly from hay is uh, much faster than it is from any other uh, feeds. Uh, in this experiment, they took uh, water samples every 10 minutes uh, at uh, 37 degrees centigrade and they analyze uh, for uh, nitrate uh, for three different uh, forages uh, that contain a similar amount of uh, nitrate of about 2.8% uh, uh, dry matter. And as you can see, for uh, turnips, uh, only 30% uh, of the nitrate diffused into water after uh, 20 minutes, and the maximum attained was only 35 of its uh, whole content after uh, 80 minutes. Uh, for a freshly uh, mown grass, the nitrate did not uh, diffuse uh, much at all, uh, only 12% after uh, six, uh, 60 minutes. So as you can imagine, uh, the influence uh, this will have on the toxicity of the feed is uh, huge. Basically, uh, chopping uh, fresh uh, forage with a potentially toxic level may not be enough to uh, have enough of that uh, nitrate uh, being released in a short time to kill a cow. So you may need to have that plant being uh, wilted and dry uh, to be completely uh, permeable and uh, liberate uh, or release uh, its uh, nitrate content all at once. So if the feed uh, becomes important, so does the, the speed of intake, uh, which is another uh, factor that was also tested on these experiments. Here they have uh, four cows that were given equal amounts of uh, nitrate-rich uh, uh, roughage in the form of uh, hay, uh, hay grass, uh, uh, excuse me, hay, uh, grass pellets, uh, hay pellets, and uh, loose uh, hay. Basically, the cows that ingested their rations uh, within tw uh, 25 minutes uh, had much uh, higher levels of um, hemoglobin than uh, the ones ingesting an equal dose, uh, but during uh, 110 uh, minutes. Uh, during the first uh, period, uh, both groups uh, were uh, exchanged uh, to make sure it was not a cow effect. Uh, overall, uh, uh, when the same amount uh, was ingested in, in 110 minutes instead of uh, 25 minutes, uh, they came up with uh, about 50% uh, less uh, hemoglobin being formed. Uh, from about 22% uh, down to 12%. Uh, Based on these results, uh, they concluded that uh, uh, with uh, continuous exposure to nitrate, uh, the formation of uh, hemoglobin uh, is going to occur day-to-day, uh, -day, and its uh, concentration is going to depend on basically how much uh, nitrite is uh, produced in the rumen, and the later in turn is going to depend on the dose ingested uh, with each meal. A toxic hay that is ingested in a short period of time may be okay if that animal is uh, consuming that hay throughout the day. So really the, the daily dose is not so important as much as the, the, the amount ingested on each uh, meal. The speed of ingestion or the uh, intake of that feed is another uh, factor. And so is uh, the speed of diffusion out of the plant uh, material. Uh, most, uh, I'll have to say that most cases of acute poisoning are reported for hay, as this can release uh, the nitrates uh, a lot faster uh, within a matter of a few minutes. And finally, the nitrite in the rumen drops uh, quite rapidly, so the doses should be expressed on a meal basis instead of a daily dose. To end this uh, presentation, uh, it's difficult to predict cases of uh, nitrate poisoning because of all the circumstances that influence the risk. There are some practical measures that uh, can be taken if we understand the conditions that uh, predispose uh, for uh, potential problems. And probably the main environmental factor, apart from the type of plant, is a lack of adequate uh, water or uh, drought conditions. Under uh, uh, a drought condition, uh, plants uh, will pretty much uh, tend to store uh, the nitrate 
uh, and the plant is not capable of uh, incorporating this uh, nitrate into protein. The other uh, predisposing factors that we have alluded throughout these uh, couple of presentations are somehow presented here. I, I talked about the pH of the rumen, uh, hunger, uh, as they can, uh, it's important as they can consume a larger uh, quantity in a short time. Uh, the type of forage, obviously, uh, whether uh, water is high in nitrates uh, would also have an additive effect. Uh, so, uh, ideally, when uh, in doubt, uh, the safest thing to do is to collect uh, representative samples of your uh, forage and water source and basically uh, test uh, for nitrates. Having said this, I hope uh, you have uh, learned something by watching these videos. I know there are a lot, there are a lot of uh, conflicting uh, viewpoints, uh, particularly on the chronic effects uh, of nitrate, and what is uh, really seen on field investigations have not really been reproduced under uh, controlled research uh, conditions. So until uh, further investigations uh, clarify some of these uh, uh, discrepancies, uh, we should just uh, be cautious uh, to reach any conclusions. So again, uh, thank you for watching this presentation and I look forward to seeing you in other ones.